Welcome to Studio One. That's what we call our lounge room here at uh, Kerwin, Townsville, North Queensland, Australia. And this is our second session in Bible study. So we go straight to the Bible study as we normally do on a Wednesday night as well. We're here to study the scriptures and to draw from them an understanding of the times and the seasons. I think that's a very apt description of Bible prophecy. No man, according to the scripture, knows the day nor the hour when the Lord shall return. But we are given times and seasons. And we're going to turn to the scriptures this morning. And it's 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. If you've got your Bible with you, I hope you have. Uh, don't ever go to a Bible study without your own Bible. Make sure that the teacher and the preacher and the pastor is really in line with the scripture. Now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, the Apostle Paul is speaking to a very fervent church. Now, Thessalonica, as we know, is in northern Greece. And uh, here, these people were extremely zealous for the Lord. And we read about that in the very first chapters of this book. And in the second book, too, we, we just get a beautiful picture of their keenness for the things of God. And that comes out in these verses. I'll read them through and then we'll not dissect the word of God, but we shall just uh, look at some of the aspects of the teaching. Now, brothers, verse one, about times and seasons, we do not need to write to you. For you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. While people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly as labor pains on a pregnant woman and they will not escape. But you brothers, he makes a distinction here, but you brothers are not in darkness so that this day should surprise you like a thief. You are all sons of the light and sons of the day. We do not belong to the night or to the darkness. So then let us not be like others who are asleep, but let us be alert and self-controlled. For those who sleep, sleep at night. And those who get drunk, get drunk at night. But since we belong to the day, let us be self-controlled, putting on faith and love as a breastplate and the hope of salvation as a helmet. For God did not appoint us to suffer wrath, but to receive salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ." He died for us so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up, just as in fact you are doing. The first point I would like to make is that first verse. About times and seasons, we do not need to write to you. This is a very, very serious statement in light of the condition of the church, the Western church today in Australia and parts of America and uh, Western society. You see, the early church and the church here at Thessalonica was tremendously driven by the reality of the imminent return of Jesus Christ. And they were very aware and very alert and very attuned to the teaching of the second coming. I had a phone call, I made a phone call to Melbourne the other day. And in the course of a very important conversation, the subject came up by this very avid and totally committed Christian lady. And she said, how many churches 
in Australia are teaching very, very basic truths and alerting our people as Christians to the fact that the Lord is coming again. In light of the pandemic, in light of the great upheaval that we are faced with in this lockdown time, even with easing of some of the measures that have been taken and uh, demanded of us, she said, isn't it a very significant time? I agreed that it was. She said, well, why aren't our teachers, preachers, pastors, leaders teaching the scriptures regarding the return of the Lord? Well, I have no answer for that. I can't tell anybody what uh, they should preach. I can only be faithful to my own calling. And her pastor, their pastor, is doing the same thing. But overall, there is a desire of many churches to just continue in the way that we've always done and just modify the means of, of running church. The message hasn't changed. It hasn't got any relevancy to the return of the Lord when we are right there on the cusp of what God is doing and make no mistake what he is about to do and what he's about to allow. So I pray that you will be able to encourage your pastor. You'll be able to encourage your leadership. You will be able to be encouraged and encourage other fellow believers to get into the scriptures and understand the relevancy of the signs of these times and these seasons. Let's go back to 1 Thessalonians. Now, chapter 5 is where we are. And um, I just want to say something else relative to this. He says here, speaking to this church in what is modern day Salonica or Thessalonica, for you know very well that the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Now, like a thief in the night is one description, like a flash as of lightning is another. So there's going to be an instant, sudden appearing. And then by contrast, he says, the people. Now, when the Bible talks about the people, he, it is always descriptive of the people of the world. Because when he is talking about fellow Christians, when he's talking about believers, he calls them a number of titles. He calls them the elect. He calls them the people of God or the people called out for his name or as in Israel, the people called by my name. <clears throat> so here we have this tremendous statement and he says, while people, the people are saying, peace and safety, suddenly destruction will come upon them. Now, this word peace and safety could be because of some treaty that has been enacted that gives a tremendous sense, a false sense, but a true sense to them that, oh, the tumult and the upheaval that we've put up with has come to an end. There is already in our world tremendous tension. And you will find universally people saying, what's going to happen next? Now, this is common here in Australia. Over the last year or 14, 15 months, people have been saying, what is coming next? We had massive flooding, even in this region where I'm speaking to you from. Uh, we thankfully were not affected at all by it, but we were affected in a secondary sense by those who are friends and family who were flooded out. And uh, some people are not even back in their homes yet. They are still being repaired and uh, refurbished and so on. So that was a massive catastrophe here in the region. The flood was catastrophic. And then later, of course, we had the fires. And it seemed when you looked at the map 
on the newscasts that almost the eastern seaboard and the western seaboard and South Australia as well, they were just engulfed in flame. And so the whole thing just shattered the illusion that we were impervious to national disasters. Oh yes, we've had localised and tragic fires before and flooding, but these were catastrophic. These were widespread. Whole cities came to a halt. Some towns were absolutely decimated, destroyed and burnt out. And so people began to say then, what's going to happen next? And then of course the pandemic. And we're in the middle of those restrictions now, and that's still having a tremendous, a tremendous effect on people, not in Australia alone, not in New Zealand alone, not in the region, but in the whole world. And within days of that coming, all of a sudden the whole world is in lockdown. People of great note, authority, uh, are suddenly as much a victim as those in far-flung places in the earth. So we live in a time of great international tension. And there is an agitation with that tension as we're beginning to see demonstrations in many cities, even in America, where, come on, we need changes in government and by government, there's going to be agitation, it's going to rise, and it's going to cause a lot of tension in the nations. And of course, that will build up to a point where there is tumult. Tumult means where there is upheaval of an international and national uh, state. Now, the Bible talks about that. We have that in the book of Luke and uh, chapter 21. We read these words and it's this. There shall be, verse 25, there shall be signs in the sun and in the stars and the moon and there will be also upon the earth tumult, distress of nations, and also with perplexity. Now, the upheaval will be such, and we touched on that last time we were together, there will be such an upheaval with perplexity. Why the perplexity? Because we don't have an answer. And we don't have an answer politically, governmentally, for what we're facing because we've never been down this route before. We've never been down this track before. Never had international problems to this extent before. So there's anxiety, there is distress, and there is perplexity. Perplexity is anxiety because you don't have a way out. You just are imprisoned within your catastrophic circumstance. And then there's this biblical phrase that appears in the Old Testament and the New, and it's simply, simply this, the sea and the waves are roaring. Now that's the tumult that we're talking about. The nations are hitting each other, not necessarily in war or aggression, but their circumstances are such and uh, there's upheaval in the nations. Well, the Bible is very clear. We have, and we're going to touch on this, we have not only the extent of the problem, but we also have divine principles by which the Christian believer can live by and have perfect peace and a sense of the protection and the provision, the preservation of God. It's in that tremendous context that we go back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And it says here that the world will be crying out for peace and safety. It doesn't say necessarily there is peace and there is safety, but they are demanding it and crying out for it. And then the Bible says in the midst of this, 
destruction will come. So there's going to be tumult and then there's going to be greater tumult bringing like a tempest upon the earth. Now, I wouldn't want to be a non-believer. I wouldn't want to be a non-Christian, a scorner of the Bible, a scorner of prophecy and a scorner of Jesus Christ. I would want, as Peter says, to make my calling and election sure because the engulfing of this tremendous upheaval and tempest will be catastrophic beyond anything that we can know or understand. So much so that the world in their crying out for peace and safety will elect a one world government and they will find in that government the emergence of someone they feel, oh, wonderful, we can trust this person. And he will be the most charismatic and the most winning person that has ever graced the platform of political power in the history of the world. He shall stand there as an absolute paragon of virtue, But beyond that veneer is the spirit of the Antichrist. And so the Bible says that while people are saying, while people are saying peace and safety, destruction will come on them suddenly. And you will have to go to the book of the Revelation to find out what will happen. The upheaval, the judgments, the chaos, the spiritual upheaval. And yet, if you are a true believer, you won't be part of it. You will not be in the midst of that terrible tumult and tempest. How do I know that? Because the Great Tribulation has a twofold aspect. And the Tribulation is that period when the Antichrist emerges and his world system. And God will oppose it. God will attack it. God will chasten it. God will judge it. And the nations of the world and individuals, sadly, will be caught up in that judgment. Now listen to what the Scripture says. As labor pains on a pregnant woman, they will not escape. There'll be no way of escaping. This is the birth pangs, the crying out, oh God, what's happening? Oh God, what's happening? For the most part, there will be blasphemies out of the mouths of the unbeliever. But there is also another people that are to be considered. There are the Gentile nations and there is unbelieving Israel. One is being judged. The Gentiles and the system of this world is being judged in the Great Tribulation and Israel is being chastened and being prepared. I shouldn't have used that word chastened as much as prepared. And it is being, in a very wonderful way, got ready for the revelation of Jesus Christ, Messiah, when he comes as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So what we have is the present situation that we have now. We have this uh, great upheaval. We have a time of tension. We have a time of tumult as it accelerates. And then we are gone. And at that point of time, maybe prior to our going, maybe immediately after we go, uh, there will be a treaty where world government takes over. The Antichrist emerges and then becomes a, a terrible era, the era of the tempest. And nothing that Shakespeare could ever have written about the tempest would be compared with that which is prophesied in the book of Revelation. And it's in that period of time of tempest, the great tribulation, that Israel is being prepared for her Messiah and the nations and the Antichrist and the world system, which is Antichrist, will be judged. The bowls will be poured out and you know all about that, I'm sure. If not, 
get into the scriptures and read it. Now we are gone. Why do we say that with such confidence? Well, it's because by contrast to the darkness that is in the world, we are told you brothers are not in the darkness so that this day should surprise you like a a thief. In other words, you are alert, you're attuned, you are aware, you are ready, you are working towards the coming of the Lord. Therefore, when that thief in the night comes, you're ready to be with the Lord. You're ready to go. So in the darkest of times, the rapture will take place. Then the Bible goes on to say, you are all sons of the light and sons of the day. And we do not belong to the night or to the darkness. We don't belong to the tempest. The tempest is raging, but it's, it's a time of judgment for the nations and a time of preparation for Israel to be prepared for his return. So we're not of those that are unbelievers and rejectors of Christ. We are not of Israel, um, though we are committed to Israel. We are believers in the Lord. Our time has come to an end on earth for the period and we are removed. And then comes the next phase of the working of God towards the literal return of Jesus Christ when his feet touch the Mount of Olives. All right. Well, we're going to talk today beyond the tumult and all of those things. We're going to talk (coughs) about the need for us to discern the times and the seasons. I noted with a little bit of uh, amusement this morning, no, not embarrassment, amusement, Acts chapter 1. Do you remember the excitement that pervaded the minds of the disciples when Jesus had literally risen from the dead and was dwelling from time to time with his disciples? He would appear in Jerusalem. He appeared on the Damascus Road. uh, Sorry, the uh, Emmaus Road. He appeared in the Galilee. And he was preparing, firstly, his disciples, primarily them. And then the Bible says he appeared to 500 at once. We read that in 1 Corinthians 15. So this was a great time of of excitement and also a degree of upheaval. And I say upheaval because in conversation, it was understandable that some of the disciples, not understanding the full gamut of redemption and all the calendar of God and the plans of God and the ways of God, they were, you know, just coming into an understanding of it all, trying to piece it all together, grabbing at random different pieces of the the, uh, crossword puzzle or the picture puzzle and, and trying to trying to make sense out of the whole thing. And so it's in that state of mind that they speak to Jesus and in verse seven, uh, six rather, of chapter one of Acts, uh, they ask him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore Israel? Are you at this time going to restore Israel? Israel to its kingdom, its glorious kingdom. You see, they were well well versed and well aware of prophecy where they knew that there was a day coming when the Lord would build up Zion. And we read that very profoundly in Psalm 102. When the Lord builds up Zion, suddenly he will appear in his glory. So I can well understand the disciples saying, well, look, you know, we're under the heel of Rome. We are a decimated people, a defiled people. 
We are damaged. Uh, we're not holy. Uh, you have proven the power over the grave, the power over death. You are the Savior, the Redeemer. Uh, you are going to be crowned with glory and honor. The King of kings, the Lord of lords. Is it now that you will restore the kingdom to Israel as per the prophecy, not just not just of the psalmist in Psalm 102, but also Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah, who said a king will reign in righteousness. A man will be a hiding place and the nations will find refuge in him. Is this the time? Valid question. Valid question. Given the circumstances and the glory of the risen Christ. And I love what Jesus says here. And he says in verse 7, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons. Now that seems contradictory to what Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. He says he would not have them ignorant regarding the times and the seasons. And yet the disciples ask, is this the time that you'll restore Israel? And he says, hey, this isn't the time for you to know the times and seasons. Well, is it contradictory? No, not at all. You need to step back and see what Jesus is saying. In order for mankind to be ready for the time when he builds up Zion, bringing the people that are to yet be scattered as they were from AD 70 to the last century, uh, in order for them to be spiritually prepared as well as physically restored for the gathering to take place after the scattering that took place, there has to be a tremendous change spiritually. And that's why Jesus had said, and we've got it in Matthew 28, we've got it in Mark 16, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Jew and Gentile, of course. I don't think that had quite dropped into their consciousness at the time that he first spoke about it. But not long after Pentecost, it certainly became a reality to the Apostle Peter when the situation with Cornelius occurred. And they realised then that the Gentiles had part in this universal uh, redemption. Marvellous that Jesus was saviour of Jew and Gentile, bond and free, black and white, rich and poor, male and female, the whole world was loved by God, as, as Jesus had said to Nicodemus. Now, the problem with the Jew, the problem with the disciples was they were transfixed on the restoration of the kingdom. They were uh, obsessed. And wouldn't you be? Wouldn't you be? Of course you would be. You see, you believed in the glory that is Israel. You would believe that the glories of the tabernacle, then the temple, the glory of the land, the glory of the worship of, of Almighty God, that made that nation so peculiar, so unique, so above all other nations of the earth. And then to have this heathen kingdom this kingdom of iron that was seen in Nebuchadnezzar's statue come and defile the land and, and take control. Of course they were saying, oh, we want the glory days of the new kingdom. And here is the son of God who was a suffering saviour who died on the cross and even all of that hadn't quite gelled in their understanding. But here he is, risen from the dead, gloriously whole, working, walking, talking, teaching, loving, revealing himself to them. Well, isn't this the time that he would restore Israel to its former glory and its prophesied glory? 
But Jesus says, now just wait a moment, there are times and seasons, no doubt. But I don't want you to become so absorbed and so obsessed with those times and seasons that you forget to go into all the world and preach the gospel. And he begins to talk about the next phase. He says these words. He says in verse 8, beautifully, you will receive power, dunamis. You will receive the enveloping and the infilling of the Holy Spirit. And he will come upon you and you will be my witnesses both in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, and even in Samaria. And I think they all went, okay. And unto the uttermost parts of the earth. I've often wondered, and I have no proof of this, but I've often wondered, did they at that time think that their witness would be to the scattered Jews? Because Jews lived in many parts of the world. Did they think that the redemption message would be exclusively for the Jews? And uh, they were peaceful about that. But of course, the plan of God in redemption was a universal, a universal redemption. Go into all the world, to every nation and preach the gospel. And you could still see that mindset in their thinking. Yeah, go to every nation, but to whom in every nation? Is it to the Gentile dogs as well? Or is it to the Jews within those nations? And it took a tremendous mindset change, a paradigm shift of immense and brilliant, only God could do this, a mind shift and a, a brilliant revelation that came through Peter of all people. Peter was one of the most narrow uh, in perspective I mean, all the things that he said through the duration of his discipleship process when Jesus was on earth prior to the cross, the things that he said, the impetuosity and the narrowness of his mind, uh, amazing. And yet it was to him that uh, the revelation of the universal gospel was given. Now, you're watching, most of you uh, have no semblance of Jewish tradition within you. If you have any understanding of Israel in prophecy, it's something you've accumulated or something you've read or something that you've understood, uh, but it's not in you. And uh, it's not something that you have uh, as the tradition of the elders. It's, it's something that over a period of time you've read up on or you've been exposed to. So you find it hard to understand. And, and uh, we often look at the whole of the Gospels, the New Testament, through purely Gentile eyes and can't understand some of the emphases. And um, it's a shame and but that's where people like I come in and and we are able to just somehow broaden the uh, picture now Jesus speaks to these disciples and he says to them I want you to know the ongoing plan and purpose of God uh, no the instant restoration of Israel is not going to take place now. That's coming later. But at this point of time, you are to, and Matthew, uh, sorry, Luke's gospel, 24, about 49 says, tarry in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. The Holy Spirit would come upon them and then they would be through circumstances and by the command of Jesus sent into all the world. But they weren't to sit there and become so utterly absorbed and microscopically theological about the coming of the Lord and miss the impact of it. And in Matthew's gospel, 
chapter 24, Jesus virtually says there are three things that a true believer in light of the second coming will become. Number one, he will pray. Number two, he'll be watching. And number two, he will be working. Blessed is that servant who when his master returns is working or so doing or doing the work of the Lord. And so that's why Jesus sort of curtails this this utter absorption in the kingdom on earth for Israel uh, plan and purpose and vision and hope and dream that uh, the disciples on that occasion had. What about you? What about me? I believe implicitly in the return of the Lord. I found it, find it the most uh, wonderful, absorbing subject. And as I stare into the scriptures and, and look at them, I think to myself, this is an absolute marvel. This is absolutely wonderful. Oh, look what Paul says. Look what Peter says. Look what Isaiah says. Look what Moses said. Look what Jesus said. And I can get so caught up and never leave my study. Well, it's good if it provokes me to pray. It's good if it promotes me or provokes me to share. And it is essential that I speak to those that are in darkness and say, look, prepare because the coming of the Lord draws near. Now, if I just sit and I become cocooned within the doctrine, it doesn't have any real effect and impact on my life or anyone else's. So we need to be very careful that we are about our Father's business knowing the reality of the teaching and letting it motivate us to become more evangelistic, more missionary minded and more prayerful. And the Bible says that he that has this hope of the Lord's return purifies himself even as he is pure. So holiness of heart and life is essential. Because the Bible says, without holiness, no man will see the Lord. So there's got to be a change, a lot of changes. And uh, we've got to see a lot of changes in the church before we can genuinely feel peaceful and say, ha ha, uh, the penny has dropped. Revelation has been received and understood and embraced. We are participators in the knowledge that Jesus is coming again and consequently we are going into all the world. We are getting behind evangelistic efforts. We are getting behind missionary programs because the night comes when no man will be able to work. So that's what Jesus had in mind. He wasn't saying to the disciples, scrub any ideas, don't think about the coming of the Lord. He wasn't saying that. He was saying, just don't get so utterly narrow-minded about it. And there are people like that. Sadly, there are people that will, well, there was a man that I think he lived down on the southern part of Queensland Every day he would write to uh, our, um, our prophetic uh, challenge, which is a Facebook um, uh, group of people, over a thousand who believe in the return of the Lord. And he would write to me, but it was always conjecture and it was always an argument and it was always a battle of wits until finally I had to unfriend him because I thought I, I, in the first part I, I became quite quite absorbed in his uh, arguments, quite interested and eager to to answer his questions. But they were a question with a barb. You know, when people are are trying to have a go at you, really, and they're not really interested in what you have to say. It's a case of just having a go. And I thought after a while, I've got more to do with my time than get just caught up 
with endless genealogies and the rubbish that Paul faced uh, in the context of his life and battle with religion. So uh, I unfriended the dear man and said to him, look, you know, um, it's getting more absorbing every day that you write and always contradictory and there is no common ground. We'll leave it at that. And you have to do that. Some people are so caught up with the doctrine but they have no practice. They have no impact. And you don't want to be like that. That, that. That's soulish. That comes out of pure intellect and nothing more. If it doesn't move you to be holy, if it doesn't move you to be right with God, if it doesn't move you to evangelise and to give yourself to the betterment of other people and the building up and the edification of the church, it's a waste of doctrine. And that goes for any other uh, because you can just get caught up uh, in, in majoring on minors and, and tearing the scriptures apart. And that's not what the Bible's all about. The Bible quickened means I'm quickened. The Bible that challenges, challenges me. And then I embrace that challenge and I change and I, I adjust my life and I go into all the world and preach the gospel. And where I can't go, I support those that can. And God blesses the ongoing work of taking that gospel into all the world. We are to declare the word of God to the church so that it might purify itself and to the nations that it might get ready. Now, Let's go back to Luke's gospel. A very amazing set of scriptures here in the 21st. There are those believers or people that study the scriptures that perhaps are lacking somewhere uh, in their, their belief that get negatively affected by the message of the coming of the Lord. Now, when the Bible says here that there will be signs in the sun, signs in the moon and the stars and on the earth, distress of nations, it means also that some people will be caught up in that distress and will become distressed themselves. And that becomes a real problem for some people. They become very agitated and they, like the powers of the world and the things that are going on, they get shaken. And because of that, they begin to lose heart. And it's very important that we become very, very encouraging and very positive and seek to build one another up uh, according to the word of God and reminding ourselves that we too, verse 34, Luke 21, take heed to ourselves, lest our hearts be weighed down with a number of things, negative, things like carousing, drunkenness, cares of this life, and that day of his appearing come upon us suddenly, and we are unaware. Now, see, some people think, well, the pressures are so great and they just fold up and they give in. Oh, well, everyone's doing it. You know, well, you know, what hope have we got? And they become hopeless and they become careless and they succumb to the things of this world. Now, that's a sad thing, but we've even seen it in the church. Because of the iniquity that abounds in the world, the love of many will wax cold. So it's our great uh, and important task to encourage one another, to build up one another, to challenge if need be one another, that we not become carousing drunks or become depressives because some people are overburdened with the cares of this life. And the Bible says this great day will come as a snare on all those who dwell on the face of the whole earth. Watch therefore and pray always 
that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. The rapture of the church will be sudden, it'll be decisive, it'll be immediate, and it'll be like the twinkling of an eye. Over as soon as it starts. And there will be a sudden loss of tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions of true believers. Not everyone that confesses to being a part of Christendom is, none, is, is a Christian. Because you must be not only a believer, you must be a, a receiver. You must know the voice of God. You must know the word of God. You must be aligned with that and you must be ready in righteousness because nothing that defiles will enter the kingdom of heaven. The Bible tells us of that. So what do we do? What do we have to remember? Well, we have to discipline our lifestyle and the eternal disciplines that God has provided are very simple. There is, of course, the word of the Lord. God's wonderful, never-changing, ever-increasing, comforting, challenging word. Here within the pages of this cover is the book of God. That's what John Wesley called it, the book of God. Give me the book of God. And I say amen to that because that is the series of principles, promises, and precepts by which we order our life. This is God's holy word. It just doesn't contain the word of God and cocooned around it is the voice and the word of man. It is the word of God. Approximately 40 authors over 1,800 years Moved by the Spirit of God, holy men moved by God were by the Spirit of God prompted, led, governed, directed to preach, to reach, to teach and to write down the sacred scriptures. Church fathers have laboured long and prayerfully to bring us the word of God. So one of the disciplines that we must uh, adhere to is to be an avid reader and meditate upon the Word of God. We uh, need to also be people of prayer, to be in the presence of God, not just armed with a prayer list as long as your arm, but to come into the presence of God, to be aware of the presence of God, to become familiar with the presence of God in the best possible way, to understand, to draw near to God and have him draw near to you. That is an imperative. So the word of God provokes prayer, gives guidelines, assurances, prompts us, guides us, challenges, directs us in our praying. Waiting on God or waiting before God is very important. I'm doing this more than I think in all the 60 years that I've been born again. I don't think I've spent as much time as I have in the last year or so waiting upon God, waiting before God, wanting to sense not just some sort of emotional high, that's not what it's all about, but to be built up in the Lord, to become prepared in my heart, in my spirit, in my soul, so that he can come to me and we can have fellowship together. And that is a great stabiliser, especially to anyone that may be volatile of nature, easily tempted with sin, person that fluctuates with moods and emotions, the wonderful, wonderful balancing of the Spirit of God in your life will give you that stability that you so long for. And you'll need stability 
in an unstable world. Waiting on God, holiness of heart. Not just abstaining from things legalistically because you know they're wrong and they'll bring judgment, uh, but really your heart's in it. And that's something that's so important. He that purifies or has this hope purifies himself even as he is pure. Well, God is pure of heart. And God says, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall see God. You know, I can knock off certain things, stop using certain words. I might sort of even curtail certain attitudes and certain aspects of my lifestyle. I might think, oh, I don't think God's happy with that. And I can stop that. I can change that. I can redirect my thinking. I can redirect my steps. And that's not bad. That's good. But it's not enough. You see, it's not necessarily holiness of heart. You see, it's out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And even though you might curtail certain things and discipline yourself, if your heart's not in it, the day's going to come when you blow a gasket and it all comes out. I could tell you a very funny story, but time does not permit. But I saw someone once who was wearing a garment that suppressed what was still there. You look at the person and you think, my, they are trim. But something happened and and suddenly the straps that kept them confined were somehow loosed and they became the real person. And we looked and it was just staggering. I saw that happen literally myself. But some people are like that. They suppress because they know, oh, my behaviour, my words, my language, uh, my attitudes are not appreciated in the confine of the church, so I better button up. And they do. But given a set and circ- a set, a set or certain uh, a series of circumstances, uh, suddenly it provokes them not to love and good works, but to uh, anything but. It's enmity and, and all the rubbish that's suppressed comes out. So out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. We need holiness of heart and we need faithfulness to the testimony. We need to be holy before the Lord and we need to be in fellowship. We need to be in a fellowship where it preaches the word of God and we need to be in a fellowship where we can encourage one another and be with one another and love one another and and challenge one another if we need to because we want every one of God's people to be in that great body of believers that are suddenly removed from this earth. And so uh, we need to fortify and stimulate, protect our faith. We need to be separate from the world and the world system and the world's influence. It's very rare these days that we sit for hours in front of our television. The reason is it's got nothing to offer. It's got no hope. It's got no challenge to holy living. It's all gutter stuff. Not all of it, but so much. And it's worldly, it's confined, it's soulish. It does nothing for your spirit. So it's up to you to maintain, to fortify and to build yourself up in your most holy faith. That's what Jude says. And a good dose of Jude would do us all. That's the second last book of the New Testament, the second last book of the whole Bible, the book of Jude. And it speaks concisely, very strongly and very directly how we should maintain our living, maintain our faith, maintain our walk with the Lord in these last days. I'm so glad to spend this time with you. I'm uh, pleased because there are so many of you that want to know more about the second coming of Jesus Christ. Next week, that when we meet, I want to talk to you about something that probably has never entered your mind relative to the second coming of Jesus. Do you remember when Jesus came, we call it on Palm Sunday, 
Uh, but when Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on a mule, where did he go? Where did he go? Almost immediately as he arrived through the gates of the old city, where was his destination? And what did he do? And how does that relate to the second coming of Jesus? Well, come back next week and we'll just begin to look at, and this will give you the clue, the 19th from 1928 of Luke. That's Luke's Gospel, chapter 19, verse 28, right through to the 21st chapters. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 23, chapter 24, and chapter 25. We won't be able to encompass all the truths that are there, but a lot of them we will. And most of all, we'll give you the context so that when you read it for yourself, you'll think, I see that. Aha! That's what Jesus meant. That's what Jesus was saying. That's what God is saying. And that's what's happening today. God bless you. God keep you. God make his face to shine upon you. God be gracious to you and give you his peace. And Father, we pray that each and every one of us will have such a hunger for the word of God. Not so that we'll become academics, but that we'll become disciples, that we'll become apostles of the message, gone into all the world, preaching the gospel to every creature and edifying not only ourselves and those that are closest to us, but to all our loved ones. Bless us, we pray, and everyone that chances to hear this message or who deliberately sits down with their Bible and pen in hand, we pray blessing, 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 and more blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Be with us Sunday mornings, 10 o'clock, Wednesday evenings, 7.30 for live streaming. We want you to be there because we want you like us to grow in knowledge and in the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ.